Uh, first of all, uh, Mary Kay Mag said, this is your second or third time? Second, second time. Uh, who will talk to us about her experience, life as a foreign, foreign correspondent in China. I'm going to do this as three acts, three eras with one preface. Because um, I was in China twice, uh, based in China twice as a foreign correspondent for a total of about 14 years, plus the better part of a year in Hong Kong. Before I was in China, I was in Southeast Asia. I was a correspondent based in Bangkok, covering Southeast Asia in the late 80s and early 90s. And one of the things that got me intrigued about China, I mean, I obviously grew up being interested in China in various ways, but um, living in Southeast Asia, you know, China loomed large, and not always in positive ways in that era, because there was still um, a very, you know, there were fresh memories of how the Chinese Communist Party had funded communist insurgencies in Southeast Asia. There had been a lot of turmoil because of that. But, you know, early 90s, Deng Xiaoping had said, you know, okay, um, to, let's, let's open up more. Southeast Asian uh, Chinese diasporas were starting to look to China and, and uh, were saying, okay, well, you know, maybe we have a different way of connecting here. Um, and, and let's go in more. After doing a series on these Chinese diasporas, I persuaded my editor at National Public Radio to um, let me open a bureau in China. At that point, amazingly, NPR didn't have a bureau in China. And uh, so they said, okay, yeah, you, you, you can go. Um, you'll have, you know, like a summer to learn Chinese. Uh, which was insane, but uh, I built on that after I was there as much as I could. Um, so when I was covering Southeast Asia, and this is relevant to covering China, you'll see why in a moment, um, I was covering Vietnam, Cambodia, Burma. I was used to being in countries that were rather repressive, um, where there was an intense distrust of journalists um, at that time, where if you went into Vietnam or Cambodia, you had to have a minder with you at all times, government minder. They charge you for the privilege of having the government minder with you. They charge you for the car that they gave you to get around. You couldn't hire your own. Um, so I was familiar with that system, and that was a good thing, because when I first got to China, it was the same system. In Burma, um, there wasn't that system, but you were followed all the time. Um, and if you talk to someone, so this was in the, the, the years right after the military coup in Burma, and um, there was a lot of you know fear, and you know a lot of Burmese would nonetheless still talk to foreign journalists when they visited, but they knew they were taking a big risk. So I got used to being aware of who was following me, and you know sort of trying to protect my sources as much as possible. So I get to China, I get my press credentials, and a number of things are different from what I expected. Starting with the day that I go into the foreign ministry and they hand me the book of regulations, and there are quite a few of them, um, which you know, at the time included the regulation that if you're a foreign journalist, you have to ask permission pretty much before you do anything, before you interview almost anybody. Um, and if you want to go outside of Beijing, you have to contact the local Waiban, the local foreign office. Tell them who you want to interview, what stories you want to do. They will decide whether you can do those stories there. And then um, you, you go and you know, they'll give you an interpreter, they'll give you someone who will sort of watch over your interview and that's, that's it, that's how it will go. Um, so on the surface it sounded like, oh okay, I know how this goes, I've experienced this before. But in fact, as I was sitting in these overstuffed you know, this, this you know, reception room with overstuffed chairs and doilies and you know, the tea thermos nearby. Uh, the official from the foreign ministry who handed me the book of regulations said, we don't expect everything you write to be positive, but we hope it will be fair. So I said, okay, I think I can <laughs> hit that standard. I'll certainly try to. Um, now, I, I had said that there would be a preface to the three acts, and I'm about to launch into the first act, which is the first time I was based in China when I opened NPR's bureau. But before that, I actually was in China one other time, and that was in 1989, right after the Tiananmen crackdown. Um, and so 
some of my impressions came from that era, right? So, um, you know, then it was certainly true that, I mean, I was staying with a, a friend and colleague in the Gentleman Y Diplomatic Compound days before I got there. Um, tanks out on the second ring road had fired into the diplomatic compound and there were bullet holes in the wall of my friend's apartment. So it wasn't a very constructive relationship at that particular time between journalists and the foreign ministry. It was an unusual time. It was an unusual time in many ways. Um, but, but that was kind of in the back of my head along with all of the fears and anxieties that you know, Southeast Asians who I knew, who I you know, reported on and, and knew as friends, had about China. And it was, it was really almost this you know, phantasmagorical you know, sort of presence, uh, image in their imaginations about China. So I get to China, I'm living in China, I'm you know, starting to you know, jump through hoops um, to get my bureau set up and to get an apartment. And I realize this is so much easier here than it is in Thailand. You know, the bureaucracy works so much better. And there's all this you know, sort of space to do things that I hadn't expected to have. I'm not being followed as much as I thought I would. Um, I, you know, there, there were certain things that you had to um, be seen to be doing. Like if you did go, this is in the 90s. If you did go out to the provinces, um, it was generally a better thing to have contacted the foreign office in the provinces. But I was finding increasingly that while, while foreign journalists did do that in the mid-90s, by the late 90s, there were all kinds of ways around it, which was sort of a classically Chinese way of doing things. You know, there's a regulation, and you sort of pay attention to it, but you find ways of doing what you need to do as well. So, you know, for instance, maybe you'd uh, have a story you really wanted to do that was a little bit sensitive in Yunnan province, so you, which I did. <laughs> so you, you go uh, earlier than what you told the, the foreign office you were gonna do. You do your reporting, you go and you do some um, benign story. In my case, for this particular trip, um, I went to uh, a wildlife preserve. And uh, to my surprise, I mean, so, so I did the, the other stories I was doing on illegal logging and drug trafficking across the border with Burma. Um, I go to this wildlife preserve, I'm thinking, you know, nothing is less controversial than, you know, just doing something on the environment. But I'm talking to um, one of the people who worked there who's saying, well, I don't know if I should talk to you. It's like, well, why? And then this is with the, the Y bond, the foreign uh, office minder with me. And he said, well, you might use the information, you might give it to your government and you might do something to harm China. And I was <laughs> thinking, okay, um, this, was a, this was a guy of a certain generation. You know, he was, you know, 20, 30 years older than me. And I mean, I think his generation grew up with a certain amount of suspicion of foreign journalists. In the 90s in China, I found, you know, I was going around with a microphone when I was talking to people. Some interviews were arranged in advance, but quite often, as often as I could, I would just go out on the street. I would when I was out in the provinces, and I traveled for at least a week every month. Um, I got to every province in China, most of the provinces multiple times. Um, I would literally just go up to people's doors and say, hi, I'm an, an American journalist. I'd like to know, you know what you're thinking about here, what your concerns are. Can I sit and talk with you for a while? And mostly people would in the provinces, mostly people would say yes. When I stopped people in the streets in cities, there'd be a lot of um, hesitation and like, well, what do you want to ask me? And I don't, you know, and, and you know, just sort of carefulness about what to say because I think there was still a, re a real fear that you know I could say something that could get myself in trouble, and I don't know about you, you know, I don't know if I can trust you. That's Act One. I left China for three years. I got back in early 2003. And um, I remember, I mean, things really had changed in interesting ways I wasn't expecting. Um, one was I was going around with my news assistant. I remember there was a demonstration, sort of a spontaneous demonstration in Beijing. If this had happened in the 90s, you know, there'd be a way of covering it, but you kind of had to keep back because 
if police saw you there, you'd be detained immediately. And my assistant was just fearless, and actually nothing happened to us. And I thought, wow, that's really different from how it was you know, as recently as, as three, four years earlier. Um, I would say 2003, and, and David Wertheim touched on this a bit. I mean, I think there was this sort of, if, if you would, golden era <laughs> between about 2003 and 2008, and then, you know, a different kind of uh, golden era for the internet that stretched into 2011, 2012, when there really was this opening up. Um, in the 1990s, in terms of Chinese journalists, um, and that's the other strand. I'm mostly talking about my experience as a foreign correspondent because that's what I know, but I also know what I saw and um, what I learned from Chinese journalists, friends, and colleagues as I talked to them over time. So in the 90s, Chinese journalists kind of held, you know, hung back at press conferences or asked very canned questions, you know, that it sounded like someone from the Communist Party had written them for them or they knew what they should ask and nothing more than that. I was at press conferences in 2003, 2004, 2005. There were really edgy questions from Xinhua, from um, you know, state-run media, and then increasingly from sort of second-tier, third-tier cities, um, newspapers, and then other you know, magazines. There, there was just this, um, this expansion of uh, what was available in terms of young journalists being able to say, well, what's actually happening in our society? Um, you know, what problems do we have in our society? Thinking of themselves more and more as journalists. It was also true at the same time that some of those same journalists were taking what was, what's called red envelopes, hongbao, from corporations and from government departments um, that you know, included uh, you know, taxi money, money for your transportation to get um, to the press conference. It was usually a good deal of money, much more than would cover your taxi. And um, so, because journalists, Chinese journalists weren't often paid that much, um, you know, they would, they would take the money and they would sometimes write then what the, the corporation or the sponsoring entity wanted them to write. But I was impressed when I was there then at how, um, how much initiative there was and how even when local governments said, hey, you can't write about you know, this controversy in our province, they'd sort of shrug and say, okay. And so they'd go and write about that controversy in a neighboring province, or they'd give the reporting that they did to a foreign journalist, or they'd find a way of getting it online increasingly. Um, and I was looking at that, and I was looking at the increasingly creative use of the internet in China. Um, as more and more people got online and realized even before the birth of Weibo in 2009 that this was a way that you, know, you can actually start to hold the government accountable. Um, you can start to have more of a dialogue with the government. Um, and it was an interesting time because I think at that point, early in the tenure of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao, they wanted to hear public opinion. You know, they didn't want to lose control, but I think they still saw the internet as being a constructive tool and that there was a way of, you know, sort of moving society forward where, you know, there'd be sort of a gradual opening up and, and the party, you know, would be able to, you know, sort of stay ahead of that. Um, as a foreign journalist at that time in China, it was great because, I mean, basically by the time I got back in 2003, um, Nobody was paying attention to those old regulations. They, you know, they were still on the books, but even the foreign ministry didn't expect anyone to you know, be calling the local foreign office and, and saying, can I please come to your province and report on X. People were just going. They were still occasionally getting detained by um, the Public Security Bureau. And if journalists got detained by the Public Security Bureau, usually what happened is you had to write a self-criticism there were foreign journalists who had written so many of these that the Foreign Security Bureau officials would just throw the paper in front of them and say, you know what to do, and be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and it was just, it was almost like a game then. Um, I was president of the Foreign Correspondence Club in China in 2004, 2005. And um, 
there was an opening up that was happening then. I mean, I remember when uh, an AP photographer got beaten up by a plainclothes cop um, after a riot broke out after the China-Japan football match in the summer of 2004. Um, Chinese fans were rioting because the Japanese had won. And um, I, I protested to the foreign ministry on behalf of journalists in China, foreign journalists, because um, I said, you know, he was just covering a news event and he just, he got clubbed over the head and got a concussion for covering this. I signed the letter both as president of the Foreign Correspondents Club and as um, then correspondent of the world, uh, the PRI BBC program, The World, I'd gone back for them. Because I knew that the Foreign Correspondents Club, which had hundreds of members, um, was seen by the foreign ministry as not, not legal. They didn't at that time see us as being illegal. They just saw us as being somewhere in the gray area. I mean, in the 1990s, foreign ministry officials had come to our Christmas parties. There, there was one who had uh, come to a farewell party of a foreign correspondent, and they danced a pretty mean jitterbug that evening. <laughs> it was impressive. Um, and, and that kind of relationship had continued you know, into the early 2000s. Um, there was a feeling of, you know, it's better to have foreign correspondents in China, living in China, where they understand what day-to-day -day life is like, where they're getting out in the field and, um, you know, going to second and third and fourth tier cities and, um, and villages and farms and just seeing how people live. It's much better than just having people inside the beltway or, you know, in the capitals of their respective home countries pontificating on China without, you know, clear information. Um, but so, so I had sent this letter, and I get a call within an hour from Hong Lei, who some of you here know because he became a spokesman for the foreign ministry later. But at the time, he was actually very open. He, um, he said, you know, come on in and let's talk. And he said, I'm, I'm very sorry that this happened. We'll look into it. We'll see what we can do. Nothing did happen, but at least it was a sign that it was like, you know, we do take you seriously. We do take your concerns seriously. We don't think foreign journalists should be beaten up um, unnecessarily in China. Um, uh, a couple of years later, the foreign ministry actually uh, interacted with the Foreign Correspondents Club. John Watts, who was a uh, correspondent for The Guardian, was then the, the president, um, to, to say, you know, we'd like to get rid of these regulations, or at least to change them. And, the Foreign Correspondents Club was actually able to push for the regulations to just go away. I mean, the, the one that said you have to ask permission before you go outside of, China, uh, outside of Beijing. Um, said, let, why, why can't it just be that foreign correspondents can interview anyone who agrees to be interviewed? That was what the ne new regulation was in the lead up to the Olympics. Um, so suddenly, it was interesting watching the Public Security Bureau trying to figure out, well, how do we control you if there's no regulation that we can point to? Um, and I had a couple of situations where I was, you know, out testing, you know, what the new situation was. And in fact, um, you know, no one stopped me reporting on sensitive uh, subjects like, you know, land grabs by local officials. I mean, there were police who were trying to threaten the people I was talking to. You know, who were you know, trying to grab my assistant aside and say, you know, you're, 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 you're basically betraying your country. Why are you allowing this foreign journalist to report on these negative things? But, um, but they didn't stop me or other people at that time. It was in the lead up to the Olympics. The Chinese government cared about its image, um, cared about China's image, wanted to, you know, be able to welcome the world in. Um, that started to change, and I think that there was a big change starting in 2008 uh, with the Tibet protests in March. Um, probably actually the change came a few months before that when um, there was a party congress, there was a new group of leaders, which included Xi Jinping coming in as vice president, um, and Zhou Yongkong, who was head of the Public Security Bureau. And these guys were much more hardcore. They were seeing that you know there was a an evolution towards something they were uncomfortable with, which was a much more open China, a much more open um, flow of information within Chinese journalism and from foreign correspondents and on the web. And so they started to ratchet it down. 
Um, and increasingly, when foreign correspondents went out into the field to do their reporting, um, you wouldn't exactly get stopped by police initially, but you know, you, there would suddenly be you know, angry local villagers who would you know, start shoving you around or would you know, throw things at your car or you know, might even um, kind of rough up your, you know, whoever was traveling with you, your, your driver or your you know, interpreter if you had one or you know, certainly threatening the people you were talking to. And you know, as, as a foreign correspondent, and, and for most other people who I know who, who are based in China, you do worry about the people you talk to. You do want to try to protect them and to you know, make sure nothing happens to them if you're talking to them about a sensitive story. Um, so that kind of changed the equation a bit um, in terms of how we did our job. I left China in 2013, and um, I have gone back several times since, but I would say that from just a few months before I left, uh, it started to get much more, much tighter. Um, there, were, and in fact, it, it, even a couple of years before that, the Jasmine Revolution, if you remember, the you know, uprising in, in Egypt and in the Middle East, there was a lot of concern in the Chinese government that you know, this would somehow spread. And um, there was this anonymous online uh, call for people to protest in major Chinese cities in Beijing and in Shanghai. And um, in Beijing, you know, on one Sunday, there were a few dozen people who showed up. And I think one of them planted a sprig of jasmine in the planter outside of McDonald's in a big shopping district in Beijing called Wangfujing was promptly arrested. The next week, the Public Security Bureau called foreign journalists. I got a call and, um, and said, you know, you do know what the rules are, right? And I said, yes. <laughs> They're like, good. And that was all that was said. Um, as it turned out, the, the next week, I had the flu, so I couldn't go out to the, the protest. But colleagues of mine who did were uh, roughed up, detained. Those who, so, several of those who were detained were brought in front of like a panel of five people with two cameras. And they were really read the riot act and asked, you know, you know what conspiracy are you part of? I mean, you know, why are you trying to damage China's reputation? And if you keep doing things like this, if you keep showing up for events like this, you know, we're going to take this as a hostile action and we're not going to renew your visa. It became a pretty common event for foreign journalists to be threatened that their visas wouldn't be renewed if um, they didn't start being more careful in their story selection um, in terms of you know, not reporting on demonstrations, uh, which had been growing in number over the, the course of the decade, that, the last decade that I was in China. Um, the government started cracking down, as, as you've already heard, on, um, on internet conversation, um, also feeling that that was a threat. And Chinese journalists increasingly felt, um, we have to be very careful about what we cover. We you know, need to kind of pull back. Several people I know who wanted to have careers in journalism in China um, have now decided to do something else. They're either not in China or they're not doing journalism in China. So like, that's not what I, you know, had hoped to do. I mean, what I can do now is, is really just report um, you know, what the government is comfortable with having reported. Uh, some of you may have heard um, the most recent news uh, out of China on media coverage and, and reporting, which is that uh, online companies like Sina and Sohu, um, which had been sort of news aggregators, um, had started doing some of their own original reporting. And the government saying, uh, yeah, you can't do that. You have to just use uh, government approved news reports. You know, it's now illegal for you to do your own reporting in China. It's not just we're going to censor what you report. It's like don't even start, right? So for foreign journalists in China now, and the numbers have dwindled a fair bit. I think it's partly because there was more attention uh, being paid to China coming up to the Olympics and just after. There was a lot of excitement about China as a rising economic power. Um, but I think you know, as it's become more difficult for foreign journalists to operate within China, um, and as China as a news story has kind of, it's not off the front burner, but it's just not quite what it was, um, you know, I would say up to about 
two to five years ago. Um, the, the, the numbers are, are down. Um, people I've been talking to, um, foreign journalist bureau chiefs in China, have been called in by the Foreign Ministry and the Public Security Bureau and um, really kind of raked over the coals. Why did you report this story that way? Why are you reporting this story this way? We can hold back visas for your journalists. We can make life very difficult for you. You know, several journalists have um, not had their visas renewed or have um, been kicked out of China in the last three years. Um, not a huge number, given that there are hundreds who are based there, but enough that it's had a chilling effect, I think, um, on what kinds of stories people even set out to do. Um, and I, you know, personally, this is a personal perspective, I think everyone loses when that's the case because I think that generally the you know, foreign correspondents who I knew in the 90s and in the, decade of the, the first decade of the 2000s, you know, the more they were able to travel around, the more they did get to know the country and, and um, you know, the, the, you know, sort of really delve into the complexity of different issues in China the more nuanced their stories were. Um, so, you know, my hope is that this is a phase. Um, my fear is that it might be a very long phase. And I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Mary Kay. <laughs> questions? Yeah. So uh, given the current situations, do you see the journalists in China um, changing their tactics in how they report, maybe more analytical piece, or they spend the time come out of China and then write a book instead of um, doing kind of day-to-day -day on the ground reporting? Well, the thing is, if you're going to do a, an analytical piece or write a book, it's still, you still need to have the content, right? You need to base it on what's actually happening. And if you don't have the ability to do on the ground reporting in the same way that you did before, and, and, and let me be clear, you can still do on the ground reporting. I just think that we're now back to a situation that's kind of more like what it was in the 90s than than what it was in the, in the years in between. So to follow that, um, mm. what would be your advice to current crop of high school students and mm. college students who are interested in becoming a journalist um, and also with an interest in reporting in China? What, what would be your advice in terms of for them to developing their careers and what skill sets and how kind of the savviness that they need to develop in order to um, be, a, be an effective journalist? Yeah, um, learn Chinese, study Chinese history and, and culture and politics, go and spend time in China, and particularly do it when you don't have a journalist visa. I mean, go as a student, travel widely, talk to as many people as you can, you know, get a good foundation of understanding, you know, how do people really think and feel here, and you know, where, there, there's a lot of room in China for people, as I was alluding to earlier, for people to move around obstacles. And uh, you know, I have looked with admiration at how adroitly people do that, even when there are a lot of obstacles. Um, I just think there are a few more now than there were for that stretch of time you know, a decade ago. Any other questions? Uh, hi, Mary Kay. Thanks hi. for the great talk. Um, so in your experience, have you ever reported on a, an issue or a problem that the Chinese government itself hadn't realized and, and uh, they were, maybe they didn't express their gratitude, but then they, they were able to address the problem that you have reported on? Yeah, no, good question. I don't think I can claim credit for something like that, but I'm remembering a French journalist named Pierre Haskey who um, spent a lot of time focusing on the uh, AIDS blood scandal in Hunan. Uh, he, he was, so I don't know if you guys know anything about this. Let me just very quickly give you the background. So in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was uh, an idea of, you know, in, in the provincial government of, of Hunan, we can make some money by selling blood plasma. So we're gonna get people to come in and give blood and 
you know, because they can give more, and we'll pay them, but not that much, um, because they can give more blood if we, you know, take the plasma and put some blood back into them, we'll do that. But they would like pool the blood, and so you know, if there was one person in the whole group who had who was HIV positive, suddenly everyone became HIV positive. So there are a couple hundred thousand people who became HIV positive in Hunan, and the local government and Lee Kachang, who's now premier, was then party chief. Um, the local government said, uh, we, "We're just going to keep people in these villages basically until they die, <laughs> and uh, we're not, we're not going to let foreign journalists in. We're not going to let other journalists in." Uh, because we just don't want this problem to be publicized. This French journalist, um, because he knew that if you have a J visa in your passport, a journalist visa, uh, as soon as you check into a hotel, the Public Security Bureau is alerted. So there were all, all kinds of ways around that, like you stay in a hotel that's 50 miles away, or you only go in in the morning and you leave in the evening. He stayed in a hotel that was 50 miles away. He went, went in every night for a couple of months between midnight and about 5 in the morning and talk to people in these villages who wanted to talk to him. And, um, and he wrote a book. He wrote several articles and he wrote a book. He was at a foreign ministry gathering, like the Chinese New Year's gathering one year, and, and a senior official came up to him and said, yeah, I read your book. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, um, thank you. That was an important piece of work. So. Uh. I'm sorry. Someone's going to. I think th this is going to have to be the very last question, George, because yeah. of time. Quick question. May maybe I should have directed this to David, but for a long time, the chatter and chat on the uh, on the internet is sort of a, a indicator and and source of news and source of analysis. Do you find that not to be the case now? You know, in terms of get catching the sentiment of the of the people. I mean, it was great to have it. It still is important. Um, but I think, I mean, even before that, you know, there, there was a way of just, you know, getting out and, and traveling. I mean, you know, actually hitting the ground and, and talking to people and, you know, I mean, it was slower and, um, you know, less comprehensive. Um, but I think there are always ways of trying to, you know, kind of figure out what people are paying attention to. Um, I think, you know, as David said, with, with Weibo now, uh, you know, people are being much more careful about, you know, how much of my real feelings am I expressing? Um, how, how willing am I to, to delve into controversial issues? Because I know that, you know, the, the government's made examples of enough people that, you know, that you don't know where the line is and you really don't want to cross it because the penalties are high. So, you know, there are conversations that are still being held on, on WeChat and on Weibo. I mean, it hasn't gone away. But um, people um, just, just recognize that it, you know, they have to be a little more careful about what they say and where. Thank you very much, Mary Kay. Thank you. Thank you.